worship that's printed in your bulletin, we come seeking God. The one who guides us and protects us. People of God, there is nothing to fear. For God dwells in our hearts. Let us shout with joy, for God is here. Let us sing praises to our holy Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are here, that you are present with us. We ask today that you clear our minds and hearts that we may dwell solely on you and on your love. Fit us and prepare us through this worship service to be your light to a world that is hurting and hungry. And now, O oh Lord, we pray that you would be with us. Amen. And would you stand now and join us in singing number 545, The Church is One Foundation. Good news of 
of the gospel and rejoice. You are forgiven, and God's grace sets you free to love again. And now if you would, greet one another with the passing of the peace. Uh-uh. 
That's not what Jesus is supposed to be about. Because what did Jesus teach us to do? Do you know? Love one another. So suddenly, all these people realized that Jesus wants them to love each other. And so they all said, I love you. I love you. I love, you. I love, you. I love, you. love, 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 love. We can do all things with Jesus if we love each other. So let's work on love, okay? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your example of love. And we know that we like to argue sometimes. And we know that we like to think we're smarter than everyone. But teach us first to love you and to love each other. Amen. Thank you. Now, we are going to read from Psalm 29 responsibly. So if you would turn in your uh, hymn book to... 761. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Worship the Lord, O sinner. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and siren like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord makes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry for the Lord. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as ruler forever. May the Lord be strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace.
we handed out sticky notes and invited you to spread grace around by writing notes of love or gratitude or appreciation and sticking them on something um, where other people would notice or sticking it on them. As you can see, uh, once again, there are sticky notes in the pews. And this time, I'm going to ask you to take a few sheets, so grab them and they may not be near you. Make sure everybody has a few, you don't have to have a whole pad, just a few sheets. And I'm going to invite you to jot down a few phrases or words or sentences that describe how you would define or how you would describe God to someone else. Do you want them to do this right now? Yes. I think I saw pencils right here. Yes, there's pencils if you don't have them. Ella will make sure everybody gets a pencil. So I want you to do this right now. It's not a test. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> it's not a test. There are no right or wrong answers. And you don't have to share it with anybody else. But I do want you to hold on to it. Uh, if you are one of the rare Methodists that actually brings their Bible to church each week, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but you can stick it in your Bible. Or you can pull it, uh, put it someplace where you can pull it out from time to time to look at it again. We want everybody to write down just a couple of things of how would you describe God. We are starting an extensive journey into Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Most scholars believe he wrote five letters. And what we have today that we call 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter. There was a previous letter that has been lost. And you can see evidence of that if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, you will see a reference to a letter we no longer have. So we believe that what we call 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter, and it's pretty much intact. He wrote two, possibly even three more letters, and those letters are combined into what we call 2 Corinthians. We're going to take two Sundays to look at the first chapter because we're laying the groundwork. But after that, we will pretty much take a chapter a week to walk through the book. So now I'm going to ask you to read 1 Corinthians 1 through 18. Okay. So a letter from Paul to the Corinthians, beginning with the very first verse. From Paul, called by God, God's will, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and from Stephanus, our brother to God's church that is in Corinth, to those who have been made holy to God in Christ Jesus, who are called to be God's people, together with all those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place, he's their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always for you because of God's grace that was given to you in Christ Jesus. That is, you were made rich through him in everything, in all your communication and every kind of knowledge, in the same way that the testimony about Christ was confirmed with you. The result is that you aren't missing any spiritual gift while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will confirm your testimony about Christ, he will confirm your testimony about Christ until the end 
so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and you were called by him to partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other, and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people, gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each of you uh, says, well, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Christmas and Gaius, so that nobody can say they were baptized in my name. Uh, oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words, so that Christ's cross won't be empty of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those who are being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O oh Lord. May I not be to, to buy it or with it. Amen. So Friday, I had a 9 a.m. appointment to get my new internet. Uh, I had been looking forward to getting fiber optic internet. I had it some eight years ago, and uh, it was finally my turn. And so two young men show up at my doorstep at 9 a.m. prompt. Uh, one was tall and one was a little uh, shorter. Uh, they were in their 20s, and they came in, could not be more delightful. They were uh, polite, uh, they asked a lot of questions. Uh, the taller one was very upset that my dog, Dolly, was frightened of him. But she's frightened of any male, including the two Robbins boys. You remember a couple of years ago, she uh, ran and hid from you. And, uh, but we got to talking about, uh, I, I made the comment that we had their fiber optic uh, here where I worked, and he asked where I worked, and I said First Methodist, and he asked what I did there, and I said I was the preacher, and then come to find out, uh, we both grew up in the same denomination, and we both grew up in South Arkansas. Uh, he now lives in Hampton and goes to an Assembly of God church. And uh, I asked him if he uh, knew that the Assembly of God was a break-off from the Methodist Church, and he did not know that. And so we had a discussion about the holiness movement uh, that happened some 120 years ago and the various denominations that broke out in the holiness movement and how that we as United Methodists, even though we don't speak in tongues in our worship services, uh, we recognize that as a gift of the Spirit. And, and we celebrate that. And he proceeded to talk to me about his church speaking in tongues and, and the interpretation of tongues, which I found quite interesting. And then he made the most profound statement. He said, I can't explain what I see in worship, but I believe it. But it would have never been accepted in the church I grew up in. He said, ma'am, I just think some people want a pretty small God an earthy type God. What a profound statement for a 27 year old to make. They were familiar with earthy gods in the city of Corinth. 
Corinth was a major Roman port city. It was a very cosmopolitan port city. But on every street corner in the city of Corinth, there was a statue to a god, an image of a god. So you had Apollo, who was the god of the sun. And you had Aurora, who was the goddess of the dawn. You had Bacchus, who was the god of wine, or Cupid, the god of love, Diana, the god of hunting, Juno, the goddess of marriage, Jupiter, the god king, the god of the sky and of rain, Mars, the god of war, Neptune, the god of the sea, Pluto, the god of the underworld, and many, many more. But you, you notice that they each had a limited thing they could do, and no more. They were limited by what they could do, and they were limited by how people worshipped them. In other words, they only went to the god of war if they were going to war, or they went to the goddess of marriage only if they wanted to get married. And so Paul spent 18 months in Corinth trying to build a new community that worshipped a God who did not have limits. A God without human traits. A God without human conditions. A God that was both beyond but also right with us. But it is difficult to unlearn what we think we already know. If we've already got an image of God in our head, it is really hard to undo that. It's hard to unlearn something, especially if we've been taught by someone that we like or admire. It's very hard to unlearn something that confirms who we are and doesn't require us to change. In a lot of evangelical churches, Paul's letters are used as rule books for the church. But that's not what Paul is trying to do here. He's trying not to give us the Ten Commandments. He even is not trying to appoint his finger at the Apollos group or the Cephas group or the Paul group up there or anybody else to say, you're wrong and you're right. What he is challenging everyone to do is to have a bigger picture and a bigger image and a bigger understanding of God. It was hard to do in Corinth. It's just as hard to do today in our country. Why? Because Corinth was a marketplace. Corinth was built on competition. In Corinth, like in America, there are winners and there are losers. And the pie is limited. There's not enough for everyone. So if you win, you get the big slice. And if you're second or third, you get to divide the rest of it. What you will see Paul doing in Corinthians time and time and time again is trying to help people understand that God is not pie. Grace is not limited. If God loves you, it doesn't mean God can't love me. So Paul starts with the greeting, how he normally does all of his letters. And he states in the greeting that every single one of us are called to be saints in the Lord. All of us. All of you, all of you, all of you, all of you 
All of us that aren't even here, we are all called to be saints. Then he goes into his thanksgiving. And he tells us that in every single way, you have been enriched. You have been enriched in speech. You have been enriched in knowledge. You are not lacking for anything as a church. We've all been called. We've all been blessed. We've all been gifted. And then he starts into problem number one. Confusing passion. Paulus was considered a charismatic and an outstanding preacher. There's good reason to like to listen to Apollos. Then there was another group that liked Cephas. Who wouldn't like Peter? My heavens, he traveled with Jesus for three years. He was there to witness the miracles. He was there when the water turned into wine. He was there to watch the feeding of the 5,000. He was at the crucifixion. He was there. He saw Jesus at the resurrection. Just think of the stories he had to tell. <coughs> Some, and it might have been as many as you two up there in the balcony, like Paul. Paul was not known for being a charismatic orator. In fact, he was known for being rather long-winded. But he was patient. He helped organize. And he was known as being a, a warrior in prayer. So the first thing Paul tries to state is that preachers are not gods. You don't come to church to serve or worship the preacher. You come to church to serve and worship God. You're not baptized in the preacher's name. You're baptized in Jesus' name. You're a preacher. I don't care how good they are or how charismatic they are or how much you like them, they cannot save or redeem you. The power of the church is not found in who's ever leading the church. It's not found in the preacher. It's not found in the denomination. It is not found even in the beauty or the size of the sanctuary. It's not found in the number of programs a church has or the number of Sunday school classes or the outstanding teachers. The power of the church is found in how seriously the church takes the cross and what that means in their lives. Our God is not a God that runs around with an army of the best weapons to conquer everyone. Our God is not a God with a media empire intended to blast us and wow us with videos. Our God is not a God with a bank that's handing out money to get you to worship him. Our God is a God whose mission and whose entire purpose is defined by a cross. That was a hard thing to hear for a first century audience. God being defined by a cross meant that God was defined by an instrument of human suffering, a human humiliation, and human execution. It meant sacrifice. It meant love. It meant obedience. This isn't a God that you can describe by typical instruments of human power. 
which makes God a real God. A God that can actually make a difference in our lives and who is not bound by the limits of this world. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that we serve. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. to baptize us anew with your healing power and sustaining presence. In our times of trial, we long to hear your voice saying, You are my son and daughter, the beloved with you I am well pleased. But sometimes, God, we don't feel very beloved. Circumstances in our lives, past or present, too often continue to have a heavy hold on us, making us feel inadequate and unworthy of the great gift of your love. But even in our times of sadness, despair, grief, or uncertainty, you are present, calling us by name, coaxing us to new life, working through many people and experiences to waken our hearts to receive your spirit. Today we rejoice because just as we remember the baptism of our Lord, we are called to claim that same promise of new birth through the waters of the sacrament of baptism this morning the waters and the laying on of hands to invoke your spirit, may we learn to speak with your voice, touch with your hands, and love with your heart. Enable us to know in our hearts that nothing we have done in the past or will do in the future can cause you to abandon us. Teach us that our value is measured by how much we are loved by you, not by the sum of our accomplishments. As Jesus was sent forth, for his mission in this world through his baptism and empowerment by the Holy Spirit. May we leave this place this morning convinced of our own worth and able to convince others of their priceless worth in your sight. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? Can you recruit a couple of others? Bless these gifts and bless the day. In your name we offer this. Amen.
Christ's advice to his table. All who love him, all who seek forgiveness and seek to live in peace with one another. On the night he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. When the supper was over, he took the cup of blessing and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, and when you do, remember me. And so, in remembrance of these God's mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we come to offer our own lives as a holy and living sacrifice in union with what Christ has done for us. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one in your spirit, one in ministry with each other and the world until one day we gather in great celebration at your heavenly banquet. Now glory, honor, power is yours. Now forevermore. Now with boldness, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. With those serving, please come forward. God for the children of God and feast at God's table.
one faction or the other? Then how about if we stand together and sing this beautiful hymn, Blessed Be the Tides That Bind, number 557. <laughs> Thank you.